Good afternoon, and thank you all for staying this late in the day. Um, I'd like to start out my time with, uh, with you with a short video, courtesy of colleagues at National Geographic, to sort of set the mood for the talk I'm going to give uh, this afternoon. So we're going to dim the lights here and, and just have a two-minute uh, video. It's always tough when you set up a hard act to follow for yourself, but this is, of course, the creativity of National Geographic. On a Saturday night in March, two and a half years ago, March 2008, I had sort of an unusual experience. I was sitting, talking with a friend on the phone, and uh, the friend happened to remind me that it was Earth Hour, which, as some of you may know, is an hour when uh, people are asked to turn out their lights in sort of an awareness-raising time for climate change to think about energy use. And so I got up and turned out the lights and continued the conversation. And when it was done, I got myself back to a task that I'd been procrastinating about for quite some time. I'd been asked to write a contribution for a book called 100 Words. And the idea was, if you had one moment left to say something to the world in 100 words, what would it be? And I'd hemmed and hawed about this, and I'd delayed doing it. And the deadline was here, and I was still feeling very stuck. So I got up from this dark room, headed toward my desk, without a clue about what I was going to do when I got there, put my hands on the computer screen. If you know Apple computers, the lights, were on, you know, the, the lights on the keyboard were on, even though the room was dark. And somehow the words from somewhere began to come as I began typing on the computer. And literally, they sort of came as my fingers were on the keyboard. And I want to share those hundred words with you um, to start us thinking about water. The challenges before us are less about healing the planet than about healing ourselves. We have so disconnected ourselves from Earth's beauty, mystery, and magic that we no longer feel whole. We seek satisfaction through material things rather than through connection to communities. We have lost our sense of wonder, our sense of place and belonging. Here is an antidote. The tears we shed today over war, death, disease, isolation, and aloneness are comprised of molecules of water that have cycled through Earth's ecosystems for millennia. 
Let our tears connect us back to the beginning of life and move us into constant joy at being alive. And as I took my fingers off the keyboard, my first thought was, my goodness, this was the most intense experience I've had on a Saturday night in the dark in a very long time. <laughs> But my second thought was, this is it. You know, I've been studying water for 25 years, and I thought to myself, this is really it. This is what's missing in our relationship with water. We know up here, we've read it a million times, water is life, water is the basis of life. We know it up here, but we don't feel it and know it down here in our gut, deep in our bones. And my sense was, after this experience, that somehow knowing that had the potential to change everything because it connects us to everything. 60% of me, right, is water. The water that's me could have been a beetle, a hawk, a bird flying high in the sky, a lowly snake slithering through, the, slithering through the desert, a juicy red apple, the worm in the apple. The water molecules, the H2O molecules that are me, could have quenched the thirst of a dinosaur, could have drawn a bath for Cleopatra, could have fallen as rain on a sleeping lion in Africa. The water that's me or you could have done those things. Water cycles in a finite supply across space and across time, and it connects everything. But we don't feel this most of the time. So why does this matter today? Why does this matter to us? Here we are, 21st century homo sapiens, and we're now living in a geologic era that scientists think will come to be called the Anthropocene. Why? Because of our ability to completely alter basic natural processes on a planetary scale. And if we think about water, what does that mean? We're now in a, in a very real way, a very effective way, the master plumbers of the Earth, right? We've built dams to store water and canals to move it around and big heavy pumps to lift water from deep underground. And all this has done, of course, a lot of tremendous good. We can now generate hydropower, irrigate cropland, 40% of our food comes from irrigated land. We can supply growing cities, even desert cities like Cairo and Phoenix. We can control floods. We can have recreation on these reservoirs. Tremendous benefits. In fact, it's hard to imagine, I think, our world of 7 billion people, $60 trillion a year in, in economic goods and services without this water engineering, without this amazing set of plumbing. And yet we've somehow forgotten to work into these plans, these plumbing designs, if you will, the most fundamental thing about water, and that's that it's the basis of life. And it holds this whole web of life together. You've all seen this in the news. Some rivers are now so overtapped that they don't reach the sea anymore. Big rivers like the Indus in Pakistan, the Ganges in South Asia, the Nile in, in Egypt, the Murray River in Australia, the Yellow River in China, the Colorado River closer to home in the, in, in the U.S. Southwest, not reaching the sea for extended periods of time. We've built, since 1950, 45,000 large dams around the world. We had 5,000 large dams in 1950, 50,000 today. So we've been building, on average, two large dams a day, every day, for half a century. And these 50,000 large dams literally turn rivers on and off like plumbing works. And so what they've done is disrupted that natural flow that rivers had before we got involved. Every river has what we call sort of a signature hydrograph, a natural rhythm of the river with highs and lows and floods and droughts that all of the life within those rivers has become adapted to over time. So all the species in these rivers for thousands of years have been adapting to those natural flows. And when they're taken away, they lose habitats, they lose food supplies, and they lose their life cycle cues, what tells them to begin to migrate, to find a place to spawn. So we have now this incredible biodiversity crisis in fresh water. We're losing uh, freshwater species at a rate four to six times greater than terrestrial or ocean species. Four to six times greater. Here in North America, 40% of our freshwater fish 
are to some degree at risk of extinction. Four in ten. So sturgeon that have been around since the dinosaurs, some species of sturgeon may in fact go extinct during our lifetime. And they've been around since the dinosaurs. We don't think much about freshwater mussels, I do, but we don't think much about them, but a single freshwater mussel, a little tiny bivalve, can filter and cleanse as much as a gallon of water an hour. And whole communities of them effectively act like water treatment plants, cleansing and filtering our water. The U.S. ranks first in the world in the number of known species of freshwater mussels, but today, 69% of them are at risk of, of extinction. So this web of life that we're a part of is fraying. And so the question is, what if we decided to put water's most fundamental role, right? We're used to thinking of water as a commodity, as a resource, as an input into all these things we need it to do in our society. But what if we put its most fundamental role as the basis of life on Earth, as the basis of life for all of us, as the core of how we think about water, how we manage it, how we use it, how we value it. What if we made that the highest priority? How would it change what we do? It seems to me there are a few things that it would, that it would help us to do, to put water and its fundamental role as a life support at the core of everything we do. The first thing, I think, is very simple. We'd go back and look at all this plumbing, and we'd say, okay, here we are, the master plumbers of the earth. How can we begin to give back to natural systems these flows that they need to be healthy and productive and to sustain this web of life? How can we go back and look at how we can tweak how we manage dams and canals and, and, and levees and give the rivers back these flows that life within them needs? And the good news is we're beginning to look at this and beginning to see that there's tremendous possibility to begin to restore rivers and restore the life in rivers if we ask this question. The Army Corps of Engineers, uh, which is one of the biggest dam operators in this country, has partnered up with the Nature Conservancy to look at dams in eight river basins around the country and exactly ask this question. And, and the early results are quite promising that, yes, we can begin to do some serious restoration. On the Green River in Kentucky, one of the first dams they looked at, there are mussel species there numbering something like 60 or more. And they've begun to give the river back its natural pattern of flows, and, and mussel species that have been declining for decades seem to be bouncing back. And at the same time, we've given people in Kentucky a longer use of their reservoirs for recreation, six weeks longer. Mammoth Cave, which is at the tail end of the Green River, now has habitats being improved within the cave for the unique species that are there, drawing two and a half million people a year as, as tourists to see these caves in Kentucky. So benefits to the river as well as benefits to our enjoyment of, of the river and what we get from it. So just imagine, in this country, we have 1,932 large dams managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Reclamation, and other agencies. What if we went dam by dam and river by river and asked that question? Can we begin to give rivers back by reoperating these dams? Can we begin to give rivers back the flows they need to be healthy, the flows that they need to sustain the life within them? And quite often the answer will be yes. We'd also, I think, start to begin framing our questions about water really differently how we use it, and how we, how we find the water to meet our own water needs. We begin to ask questions like, instead of going out and finding additional water by building another dam, building another diversion, can we actually do more with less through creative ways of getting more crop per drop in agriculture, creative ways of reducing by 50 percent, say, the amount of water it takes to create this or that, this or that widget? Can we be just as satisfied without buying quite so many things, ways of being just as satisfied, living just as well, but using a lot less water. And this, too, we're beginning to see. I spent a lot of time living in Massachusetts, and Boston stands out to me as a great story about this, because it's not in a particularly dry place. But they hit a limit like many cities do. Back in the 1980s, they found that their supply was just about maxed out. Their demands were pretty much at the limit of their supply. So they began doing what most cities do. They went out and looked to the Connecticut River, to expand their supply. And they were going to create a diversion from the Connecticut into the big Quabbin Reservoir, if any of you know Massachusetts, enormous reservoir in the central part of the state that supplies Boston. 
And the citizens of Massachusetts, organized in different conservation groups, said, hey, wait a minute. We actually care about the restoration work going on in the Connecticut. Is there another way? Can we do it a different way? And so the authorities, the water authorities in Massachusetts, took this concern seriously and began looking in a way that it really hadn't been looked at before, at conservation. And it turns out that, yes, those demands of the greater Boston area, two billion people, could in fact be met by using water more efficiently, installing water-efficient fixtures in homes, working with industries to get more recycling internally in the factories, beginning to price water better, beginning to educate people about water. And it all added up to a tremendous success in conservation. An email came across my desk in 2004 that said, Boston's water use was back to where it was 50 years ago, 43% lower than it was at its peak, and yet everyone in Boston is living just as well as they were before. Tremendous, tremendous possibilities for doing more with less and barely noticing an impact, right, on how we, on how we live. I think we'd also begin to connect more deeply to the water that flows in our lives every day. If you look around you, everything you see in this room has water embedded in it. There's water embedded in the food we eat, in the clothes we wear, right? In the energy that we use. You fill up your tank with gasoline, there's 13 gallons of water in that gallon of gasoline. Water's embedded in everything. The average American lifestyle, if we're an average American, the average lifestyle we're living takes about 2,000 gallons of water a day to support. 2,000 gallons of water a day. And maybe 5, 10% of that is actually coming out of your tap. Right? The rest of it is embedded in your diet. 50% or more, excuse me, around 50% is embedded in your diet. 630 gallons for one hamburger. The average hamburger, 630 gallons. 40 gallons in a cup of coffee. Most of that, of course, to grow the beans, right? And think about the connection that that creates to, that, to where those coffee beans were grown. Perhaps rain showers over Costa Rica or a river in Bolivia to irrigate the beans that then became your coffee in the morning, which connects your cup of coffee quite intimately to a watershed in some very far away place. So it's all connected. I think we'd also start beginning to see our own watersheds very, very differently. I heard a great story just a week or two ago of a young man uh, named Rex Cariz who lives in the Santo Domingo tribal lands in northern New Mexico. And Rex had heard stories from his grandfather about uh, the Galisteo Creek that had flown through the reservation for, for his entire life, and it was no longer flowing through there. And Rex decided he was going to see what he could do about restoring that ecosystem to what it had been before. And what he realized was that these invasive species, we call them salt cedar in the West, uh, tamarisk is another name for them, they can gulp as much as 200 gallons of water a day um, out of, out of the, the river when they're along the banks. And he began pulling them out. And within a couple of years, for the first time in decades, Galisteo Creek, which is a tributary to the Rio Grande, began flowing through the reservation again and cottonwoods and willows began coming back, and birds that they hadn't seen in years came back. And springs, sacred to the tribe, again had water in them. So these cycles of life that had been inter interfered with for so long began to be whole again. So imagine what could be done. We've got salt cedar on about one and a half million acres in the western U.S. Imagine what could be done if what Rex did was multiplied many, many times. And that's the power of one, multiplied many times, can create a lot of powerful change. I personally believe we can. We hear a lot these days about the water crisis, and it's always extremely despairing. But when I add up all the good things that are happening, all the ways we can begin to restore rivers, all the ways we can begin to do just as well with less water, whether it's in agriculture, in industry, in our homes, in our own communities, I'm really quite optimistic that we can get to a future in which we're giving both people and the natural world the water that they need to be healthy and productive. And I think getting there is going to be a whole lot less about big dams and big canals and, and pumps and pipes and much, much more about creativity, ingenuity, ecological intelligence, 
and a reconnection to this web of life of which we're all a part. So I hope that whoever we are, wherever we work and live, whatever we do, we'll take this on as part of our role in the world too and see that this power of, of one action multiplied many times actually creates the kind of change we can, we, we can get. So I hope we'll aim high and get involved and, and make this happen. Thanks so much.